was waiting for this thing to tell me it's recording again. So um, a long time ago, I learned that if you're dealing with someone who has two vowels in their name back to back, you pronounce the second vowel. So I'm going to see if that's the right thing to do here. Kevin Freight. 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 The rule didn't work. Kevin Freight received his BS in mechanical engineering from Old Dominion in 1983. His certifications and experience include being lead accredited. Uh, he's an ASPE member. Started his career in commercial building automation with Honeywell, um, where he had a variety of roles. Moved on to uh, Calafi. I'm sorry, Ke Keeley? Kelly. Kelly Inc., K E L E, and then joined Calafi North America in the industry of hydronics and plumbing products um, in 2013. Um, he's here today to present to you all. Uh, he's got a number of really interesting cutaways and demos on um, balancing valve overviews updates on hydronic plumbing and balancing applications on both manual on, on all manual automatic and thermal systems so kevin i'll turn it over to you okay uh, take it away thanks jonathan yep anybody ever heard of calafi before one or two okay good ever use our products any of the balancing valves yeah okay good good well, we're uh, our headquarters is in northern Italy, and uh, all the brass we make, which is about two Eiffel Towers worth every year, it's a huge process. Uh, it's all Italian brass, comes from that part of the country, from that part of the world. And uh, we have a local office here, right over next to American Family Field. I always want to say Miller Park, but our our uh, office overlooks the, the uh, east parking lot, so we're local. We love to open our doors and have folks come in and check out the facility. We have a training room. Uh, we do hydronics. We talk about plumbing, backflow, uh, a, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different topics. So, and and we love to talk about balancing too. So, uh, if you're ever in the neighborhood uh, for a baseball game, you know, give me a call. Maybe you can park in our parking lot walk over there. So, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a whole hour's worth of slides and they're not really deep, not a lot of math going on, not a lot of engineering equations. So I'd really like to open it up to discussion. So anytime you have a question, it would be great if you just ask the question and we'll we'll talk about it, okay? So I would encourage you to do that. We're going to start with a really simplified hydronic balancing schematic here. Now this will look a little familiar. Luciano covered some, some of this this morning. But let's uh, let's say you have a residential boiler. This might be in, in your home. Uh, so we have a, a fill valve here that provides water to the system, an expansion tank. This is a closed system, and this boiler will um, produce you know hot water for these heat emitters. This device here is an air separator because air in hydronic systems is bad, causes corrosion and all kinds of really bad stuff. So if you ever see this symbol here, that's an air separator. So we have a circulator here that will pump water to these three zones. Uh, this is a larger heat emitter. Let's say this is in your common living area. So it might be a six gallon per minute. Maybe it's a good size wall radiator uh, for that, that area. This is a zone valve, so somewhere in that area will be a, a thermostat that will control this on off valve. So this would be a three zone system. Uh, these are, you know, uh, on off spring return valves. So the thermostat contact closure pops open that valve. Uh, it's not modulating in this case, it's on off. So each heat emitter has a design GPM. Uh, if you get uh, if you buy a wall radiator, it's going to say at 140 degrees, I want six gallons per minute, for example. So that's that's the performance rating for that heat emitter. Uh, so let's just say this one is a six GPM heat emitter. Maybe uh, in one of the other bedrooms, you have a smaller panel radiator with its own zone valve, uh, say maybe three gallons per minute required there. And this one might be in another bedroom, uh, say four gallons per minute in that heat emitter. OK, if you don't have balancing valves, as shown here, there's no way to guarantee that those heat emitters are going to get the GPM that they need. OK, they perform best at the specified GPM. So I guess technically it's possible to design your pipe sizes and your pipe runs to deliver close to the GPM that those heat emitters need, but you really have to have balancing valves. And so this is a bit of an oversimplification and you guys probably know as much about this as I do, but you need to have balancing valves 
to set the GPM for each one of those heat emitters. Pretty simple, any questions so far? Okay. So why do we have to have the balancing valves? Really to set that GPM for that temperature and that heat emitter so that you get the most uh, you know, optimum performance uh, to produce heat in that zone. Okay, pretty basic. And you can scale that up too. So this is the same thing on a larger scale. Um, basically a, a heating or cooling plant, okay? And you can have balancing valves at the unitary equipment, basically at each of, say these are air handler coils or fan coils or even radiant coils. Um, you can balance at that level, right? So for each branch, you'll have unitary circuits and you might also need to balance that branch circuit. Uh, the same thing over here, okay? So you have multiple levels of balancing required for each unit, each branch area, and even, even the mains. Um, have you guys done this kind of, has everyone done hydronic balancing before? Does that look, look about right? Do you do, um, I wanted to ask you some questions too. Do you do mostly air as a group? Or is it a mixture? Do you air and water? Do your companies do both? Does the same person do both? Or do you guys specialize? Usually the same. So you have to do both air and water. Okay. Okay. Good. So balance circuits, we talked about matching the load to the to the GPM. We need to do that. It's very important. Reduce noise. Water velocity that's too high will, will cause noise. It'll cause pinhole leaks in the copper. So balancing a properly balanced system will also reduce noise and uh, maximize the efficiency and meet the design requirements. So whoever designed these systems, it's in their best interest uh, to make sure that it gets balanced properly. Um, are you often like the last person on the job? Um, you know, you, you, you may be under a lot of pressure to get the balancing done. Uh, it's such an important step, though. I mean, if you don't do it, if you don't have the time to do your job right, the customer isn't going to be happy. So everything upstream of that doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's so critical. And we, we hear a lot of people talk about balancing and how challenging it is and how important it is. And uh, we get calls, um, a, a lot of calls from contractors that are have questions about balancing and wonder how can they tell if it's done right if they go around and all the valves are wide open then somebody didn't finish that job so we we hear about that how about plumbing do you guys also do balancing in domestic recirculation systems you do I'm seeing some yeses okay how how different is that from hydronic balancing Small numbers. Small numbers. The GPMs. Yeah. Okay. What's what are the main pain points when you're talking about hydronic versus plumbing? I mean, where where are those challenges for you? Anybody comment? We usually see that the circuit setters or the panels now are too large. Well, that's required. They're too big. Too large. The engineer might say. Uh, circuits to set them all the same, but you've got a five GPM pump and circuit centers that can't measure that divided by three. Okay. Okay, so sizing the valves are not always sized properly. Okay. What else? Too big of a pump? We hear uh, a lot of solutions are put in a bigger pump that that guy on the far east end doesn't have any domestic hot water upsize the pump is that the, is that the right answer no no it's not so in this case here without any balancing valves this 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 group of fixtures out here on the end is only going to get a trickle of flow of course water follows the path of least resistance so most of it's going to go here some will some will go here and what's the problem out here on the end where we don't have very much flow what are the issues? Why not? Why is that a problem? Huge waste of water. Sorry? It's a huge waste of water. <laughs> right. Person using this shower right here turns on the water and has to wait 
10 minutes and they go get a cup of coffee and come back and wait for the water to get warm, all that water's wasted, right? That's fresh, clean water. It's wasted. If they had hot water right away, they wouldn't have to do that. So you're right. Water temperature will drop, okay? The water out at that far end is not gonna be warm because it's been sitting there in that pipe. It can get, uh, you mentioned the longer wait time. So there's a big potential for stagnation. If you have circuits that don't have much flow at all or even dead legs, uh, that's really dangerous. Um, Legionella is a big topic these days. You've probably read articles, you've seen articles about it. Uh, it's really important to control and uh, it's a big topic that we talk about a lot. So if you ever have uh, a, a customer or a colleague or if you need any information on Legionella in domestic hot water recirculation systems, I have a lot of information on that. So uh, feel free to uh, contact us. We'd love to help you if that topic ever comes up, okay? So if we put balancing valves in now, we're all set, right? We can make sure that each of those circuits has 0.5 GPM, for example. Um, of course, these valves and all the components have to be low lead. So you have to be careful uh, as, a, as a person purchasing these valves or installing them, they obviously have to be low lead. And we, we do hear about cases where uh, valves are installed and they're not low lead and the inspector missed them. So I don't know how often you see that. Uh, very, very important though, balancing valves are low lead type. So then we have reduced wait, wait times, less waste of water. Everything is balanced. All these fixtures have access quickly to fresh water. Um, and this is a little bit oversimplified here. We might have a mixing valve to control the tempered water, but basically these, uh, these supplies go out and then the returns are tapped out near the end of the circuit and brought back. And that's where the balancing valves go, right before you come back to the main trunk that then goes back to the heat source. So the valves always go out here on this return line and they can be three quarter pipe, even half inch pipe because you only need a few GPM. All you're really doing is getting enough hot water as close as you can to that fixture so that it's available for the user. You can think of these uh, domestic research systems as a closed system. Okay, the whole system is open because you open a faucet and it brings in fresh water and this water is all oxygenated. But in terms of thinking about the pump and the balancing, you can think of it as a closed circuit, especially at night when nobody's drawing water. It, it, technically, it is a closed circuit. Okay. Reduced stagnation is, is one thing. Okay, we'll switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about the types of balancing valves that are out there. Uh, probably some of these look really familiar to you, right? This one's really popular. Uh, that's a circuit setter. That's probably the, the number one valve in, in the world. Uh, these are some others. This is another brand. These are all manual balancing valves, also called pressure dependent because the amount of water that flows them depends on the pressure across the valve or static. And uh, the term static is used because once you set the valve, there's no moving parts. Uh, inside, it just sits there, okay? It's an adjustable restriction in the pipe. And you can think of it as, as an adjustable restriction in the pipe. These, these are used in hydronic and plumbing, manual balancing valves, and they work great. Uh, if you have a constant speed pump and you get everything set up and all the balancing valves are properly balanced, the systems work pretty good. They're fine, okay? When things change, of course, the flow is gonna change because they're pressure dependent. But for the most case, these have been used for decades and they work pretty well. And there are some other valves that, that work a little differently and we'll talk about those as well. So the flow rate will change as the system pressure changes. That's, that's the pressure dependent part of it, right? So the more differential pressure you have across the valve, the more flow you get through the valve. Thing to remember, uh, you guys probably already know this, is if you adjust a balancing valve in one circuit, it affects the adjacent circuits as well. So do you have to often, I mean, you tell me, you're, you're the pros. How often do you have to do iterative steps? You know, you set one, go back to the other, and then go back. Is that something you do every day? How, how much of, of a pain is that? Or does it work pretty well if you go through and set them in a logical sequence? 
Can somebody tell me the answer? I don't know. You do. What's your opinion about that? You do too much balancing. You have You do second or even a, even a third time if it's a big job. Okay. So is that like an all day? Say you're doing a school and there's 50 valves. How long does that something like that take? A day or two. Um, OK. So once you get them all set, they're good at that differential pressure and at that. At that uh, that point, right? They work fine. This one is different. I don't know if you, you've ever seen this. I have some samples here. I wanted to pass around. By the way, this is a uh, this is a manual valve. This is this one right here. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But if you want to look at this, we, we found a company that does really cool cutaways, and you can see how those valves work inside. This one is a little different. Um, it's a manual balancing valve, but it has a built in flow meter. Have you ever seen it before? No, I mean, let me let me pass this around. It's it's um, something's a little different. And I'm going to show you how that works on the next slide. So <clears throat> let's, let's keep moving here. So the what the first one I'm passing around there that is has a variable orifice design. So if you hear that term, what you, what it's really talking about is as you adjust that valve, you're varying the CV or the orifice in that valve in between the PT ports. So the adjustment is in between the PT ports. That is a, a variable orifice type of manual balancing valve. There are two types and this is one of them. Yeah, did you have a question? Well, I thought I saw a question. They're simple construction. They're good. They work well. Uh, this, this valve right here is a variable orifice design. Um, they're uh, inexpensive to produce, so if you have a lot of them, uh, it's not very expensive to put these in. OK, they're probably the most budget friendly kind of balancing valve you can get. A fixed Venturi design is where your PT ports are across uh, a, a fixed Venturi or a reduction in area in the pipe, so that doesn't change. When you change the setting on the valve, you're not changing the CV in between the PT ports, okay? So that's why it's called a, a fixed Venturi type. Um, now, that supposedly, it depends on the maker, but these tend to be a little better, a, a little um, more expensive, and have a little more range, and they're a little quicker to adjust too, because every time you adjust the handle, you're not changing the CV of the valve, right? So on this, this type of valve here, when you make an adjustment, you're changing the CV of the valve, OK? So you, that's where you have more iteration of having to go back and forth to do the balancing. This one is a little easier, a little quicker to balance. And this this product here uh, is, the, is by Taco. That's another type of fixed Venturi valve. So this is uh, one of the tools that that I've seen out there. Uh, it's, it's a gauge type tool and you hook it up to that valve I'm passing around. That's this one here installed. So there's your tubes where you connect it and uh, you adjust it, adjust the knob, uh, read the differential pressure. And then with this valve, this one's made by Kalefi. We have these charts. So you have to go to the chart and look at the differential pressure and then read your GPM. Now you have, I'm sure you have software tools and other types of tools. This one here has like a round uh, it comes with a round wheel um, that you can use to set set the uh, determine the GPM once you measure your DP. OK, so this example, uh, if I was measuring three PSI across the PT ports on this valve, I would come across to the setting on the knob, which would be this setting right here, and then come straight down and that would tell me I have three GPM. So this is a Kind of an old fashioned or a manual way to do it. I don't know if you guys are still doing it this way or if you have Bluetooth phones with all this stuff on them. Um, anybody want to give me an idea on what kind of tools you use? Does anybody use this? 
this uh, BNG gauge anymore? Huh? Yes? No? Okay. Do you have digital digital tools with the hookup hoses? Okay. Okay. Is that what mostly, mostly you're using? Who makes those? A few different companies like Fluke? Sure. Okay. Okay. So that's the tool these days is a digital one. Okay. Okay. Well, this is just uh, just demonstrating how with this type of valve, you, you determine the GPM based on the differential pressure. So here's this one, that second one I'm passing around. And what makes it different, and uh, you may or may not like it. I don't, I don't know if you do or not, but I'll show you how it works. Uh, I don't know if this is something that uh, would allow you to make more money or would affect how much money you can make on a job. I don't know that. I'm hoping you'll give me some input on that, but here's how it works. You don't need a DP tool to set this valve. Uh, the, way, the way it works is right here, there is a fixed orifice in here in this circle, right? So as the water comes through, it passes through this fixed orifice that creates a differential pressure. So if you pull this ring right here on that sample that's going around, you pull that ring, you open up this little bypass passage right here, and a certain percentage of that water flows through here. This is a spring loaded cartridge inside here. And this little red thing right here is a magnet. So that magnet is, is attracting that little steel ball in the window. You'll see that window on that unit coming around. So that steel ball rides up and down inside this window here and reads GPM for you. So that little window is not wetted, so it doesn't get all dirty and you know clouded cloud it up, but uh, it makes balancing a little easier because you don't have to use the DP tool. You just pull this, read where the ball is. This is your adjustment here. It's a ball valve. It's right behind here. So you just, with the ring pulled, you adjust this ball valve here until the bead is set right across the GPM that you want, and then you let go and you're done. So you can come by later and just pull that ring and, and read the GPM and make sure that it's still flowing what you want it to flow. Okay. Very cool. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for you? Is the price twice as much? It's a little more expensive. Yeah, it's not twice. It's not twice. But what what I'm curious about is, you know, that's you, you make your living on balancing water systems. Is something like this bad or good is that so true but yes i would say like for us you know we need you know, certified reading that we're going relying on manufacturing well how explain neb certified readings is a, is a well, product our, our neb sir need to be nisd traceable okay we certify like that's supposed to be three gallons and G, we plug into it. Okay, we get set at 30. We're not plugging our meters into that. Oh, okay. So we're going to say we set it for three gallons, but that's according to the manufacturer and all of the manufacturers. You know, okay. We're kind of washing our hands of guaranteeing that full rate. Okay, good point. So because you're using a tool that's calibrated, you can then certify that that GPM, you read that GPM with based our, on with, our meter. with your meter, your and you can certify. Okay. And you're verifying that that's okay, Right, without a PT, without a port to plug into, how do we verify that that is accurate? Okay, good point. We have, we have to use our instrument to get to the meter. So you wouldn't is wouldn't be able to use one of these and then make it a test and balance report because you don't you don't you don't have a way to certify. Well, we, we can do it. We can say, okay, this is set to three, this one's five, this one's a half. But you know, it's not going to be as certified. Okay. For that, yeah, there's no there's no pressure reading. You're just relying on the fact that it's been calibrated properly. Right. 
Okay. No, no, it's, it can be sideways, upside down, anything, because this mechanism right here is opposed by this spring. So they can be upside down, but horizontal, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, I just wanted to see if you had ever seen this before or heard of it. Um, we're, we sell an awful lot of them. Um, and it's, it's it's pretty popular, so you may see it. What if there's glycol? If it's glycol, if you're doing that. Um, yeah, there, in the literature, there's a correction factor. Uh, so if you have a 30% glycol, uh, you'd have to apply that correction factor. So that scale is just based on 60 degree water, right? So yes, that's 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 a point. So there's a temperature correction factor then too. Yeah. What's the maximum pressure rating? Because it's dependent on the spring flow type, right? Of course, the spring on that. Yeah, the pressure, the pressure rating on this, I think, is 150 psi. I'd have to look. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and I have I have some literature too. I want to pass out. So yeah, interesting product. Uh, it's been really successful. When when Kalefi introduced it, uh, we were wondering if people would pay the extra for it, and yeah, they are. Uh, it's 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 very popular. So let's take a look at a circuit when we have manual <laughs> balancing valves in it, and there's a change. For example, this is similar to what we looked at earlier. Let's say we have a boiler and we have these these four circuits. Uh, these are manual balancing valves, and they're set at six, four, eight, and four. What happens with a manual balancing valve if one of those thermostats closes the zone valve? Okay, what's going to happen, first of all, this circulator is going to ride down its pump curve and deliver fewer GPM, but this one's closed. Now, this circuit is closed, so we have zero GPM here. What happens with these other circuits? They're going to go up. The flow is going to go up, and maybe that's not a big problem, uh, but if you look at, for example, this one that went from 4 to 4.6, that's a pretty big change. That's 15% more flow in that heat emitter. So you may not notice it, but it, that's a pretty significant factor, okay? This this one up here goes from 6 to 6.2. Okay, that's not much change. That heat emitter will probably be just fine. This is just the nature of the manual valve, right? They're pressure dependent. So this is what happens, and in most cases, OK, been doing it that way for a long time. Probably not a big deal. It's just something to be aware of. Okay. So that's manual balancing valves. Let's talk about automatic. And uh, this was covered a little bit earlier by the first presentation, but mine's, mine's a little bit different. Uh, have you guys used these? Pretty familiar with automatic or, or uh, OK, good, good. So the big deal about those is that they're fixed flow rate. So when you order this kind of a valve, you have to order it for 2 GPM or 3 GPM or 4 GPM because the cartridge is fixed at a certain GPM. OK, and they're very compact. Uh, they're actually really low cost. And this is the inside of one. I have one here. I'll pass this around too. You can see what the cartridge looks like. Now, the spring fell out of this one, but you can still see how what's going on inside of it. So this one actually has a fixed orifice, a little tiny fixed orifice as the flow comes around here, the flow goes through the fixed orifice, and then there's also a variable orifice. So as the force of the fluid pushes this cartridge, it compresses this spring, and this orifice right here varies. So I'm going to show you curves that you've already seen. Uh, Luciano showed you these same things, but as you're coming up to pressure, the spring is not compressed. It's completely extended, and you go from zero flow up to a certain amount. As you start to compress that spring, this is what happens. That's your constant GPM right there. So as that cartridge is closing, the variable orifice is changing, and what that does is it maintains that constant GPM. So that's what that's all about. When that cartridge is compressed, that variable orifice is changing. And if you get all the way up to the maximum differential, 
then that spring is completely compressed and your flow will go up again. So within those DP ranges, they will maintain a constant GPM. So that's your uh, pressure independent or dynamic balancing valve. What happens in the system when we have those installed? Okay, same system, right? If we turn off one of those zone valves, the GPMs don't change. So this is an advantage of these little guys here. Uh, they will they will always maintain that constant GPM for the design of the coil or the heat emitter, even if you have things turning on and turning off, which you do, right? You do in a hydronic system. So any uh, thoughts or comments or questions about comparing manual to automatic? You can always just uh, caution contractors to make sure that your systems are clean. They're clean. They're going to use this type of device. Yeah. Yeah. We hear about these automatic balancing valves. Um, if you don't flush the piping really, really well, and you get a bunch of dirt and crud built up, those little orifices inside the cartridge that you can see, they'll get clogged up, and they they do require cleaning. If you have a lot of scale and corrosion and uh, hard water deposits, they can get clogged up. Yeah. Ever heard of a thermal balancing valve? These are for plumbing only. Anybody? These are fairly new, okay? For a domestic hot water recirculating system, this is a completely different animal. Um, let me let me tell you how they work. This, this guy right here has been around for a while. Um, it's probably the first one on the market, really. They've been heavily selling this across the states uh, in, in, in the engineering world. What makes it different is this cartridge right here. If you see in this red circle, that's a sealed copper cartridge, the same kind of thing you'd find in a thermostatic mixing valve. And it's just, it's got wax inside. And as it heats up and cools down, it has this, a plunger uh, or a, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, this part of the valve right here. It contracts and expands. So when this thing gets hot and cold, it expands and contracts and opens and closes a valve seat. OK, so that's what makes this thing different. Uh, it responds to temperature. It does not respond to pressure. You don't use a DP tool uh, for this animal either. It's completely based on temperature. So let's take a look at that, how that how that works. Let's say you have a um, uh, water storage tank in your building and it's depleted. It's uh, it's run down. It's, it's cold. OK, uh, you're pumping. In your recirculation system, your water is colder than you want it to be, all right? Mm -hmm. These valves would be open all the way, okay? And let's say that your water temperature was, I don't know, 90 degrees. All of these valves would be up here, fairly, fairly open. In fact, if you get below 70 degrees, all the valves are wide open. So in vision, you had a whole bunch of these valves in the system and they were all wide open. As your heater comes up to temperature, the valves that are closest to the heater are going to start to get warm, right? Because of the path of least resistance thing. So the valves that are closest to the heat source are going to start to modulate closed as your water temperature increases. They're going to modulate closed. They never close all the way. There's always a minimum flow. And I've got one here to pass around. So these are the only valves that actually modulate open and close, like a modulating control valve. And what that does is when they're open, that circuit has most of the water. OK, when they start to modulate down closed, it pinches off the water coming to that circuit. And what's that do? It pushes the water to the next circuit, right? So if those circuits that are closest, let me go ahead and advance the slide. If Here's here's the scenario. Here's the water tank. As as it delivers water, these balancing valves are here, right? So if this was all cold, this valve would get warm first. It would shut down towards minimum. Then that water would then be forced to go to the next circuit. So this this circuit here will get more water. As that one comes up to temperature, it shuts down to minimum as well, and so on. 
So these valves, they all open and close in a dynamic way to respond to the temperature in the system. So that's what makes them so different. They, they don't care about pressure. They don't care about GPM. They just control flow rate. See how that works? The more flow you, the more flow you have here, the warmer that research temperature is for that set of fixtures. So if you haven't seen these before, you may see them come up in specifications. I, I don't know how often they're used around here or how often you're seeing them. Yes, sir. Seeing them more often than you never know what they're doing. In the what? <laughs> These valves? Yes, and you turn the valves, you use the pump. Yeah. What, one of the nice features about this is the temperature gauge that you can stick in there. Uh, and it'll you can tell visually whether your water is up to temperature or if it's too cold. So that's one of the features of the one that we make that has that gauge on it. Does that paraffin ever break down over time as it cycles? No, they last years, years and years, years. This, uh, gosh, they, they, uh, the valve will scale up when you throw that away long before the, the wax element goes bad. Yeah, I've never seen one broken either. So they're bulletproof. They're used a lot. And the thermostatic mixing valves, you find those. Um, in uh in, in other devices too they're just that little sealed element pretty pretty widespread it's used all over the world there's only a couple of people that make those and they're they're pretty solid yeah so again completely different animal here uh, if you do a lot of domestic hot water you may come across that so here's some installation pictures always like to throw a few of these in there um, Here's a uh, one of our uh, fixed uh, Venturi valves hooked up to a meter. Here are some of those, that first one I passed around, uh, the small manual valves installed. This one's, this one's cool. This, uh, if you notice, these are upside down, okay? The flow is down and that's fine. They work just fine that way. So these are on a bunch of different domestic hot water uh, return risers that are coming down. So here's the supply going out. Here's the return coming back. You can see the pipes are different sizes, right? This maybe is a three quarter, that might be a half. So that's a nice picture of, of, of that. And then here is the hydronic system with some of those uh, with the pull ring. Uh, and then these are all installed in this hydronic system with the primary secondary. Uh, as well. So, what else do we have here? This one is really cool. I was actually on this job. This is a house up in Massachusetts, in a big house, and they had 10 zones, and each of these thermal balancing valves are, are on the uh, return pipe. So, all those returns from those different domestic hot water circuits come back to this uh, return pipe here, and then there's our circulator for the domestic. So they did beautiful work here. That's a really nice job. Do those come in different temperature ranges? Those those types of valves? Yes. Well, the setting on it is from 90 to 130. So you just set you just set whatever temperature you want. They come in different sizes, but they're adjustable. So uh, I don't know where that one went. So you just you just adjust the knob. And then that's where that's where the valve will be at minimum. If you remember that curve, once the valve came down and started to close off, it flattened out. Once you get to set point, it flattens out and stays at that minimum position. So I brought some of these. You're welcome to take them. I have enough for everybody. Uh, this is a really good uh, journal. It's not all about our company, okay? It's, it's got really good um, information about applications and uh, how to calculate things and it's got a bunch of theory in it. It's super easy to read. These are also available online in PDFs if you don't want to take anything paper with you. Um, and this one is on hydronic. So we have this one for plumbing and this one for hydronic. It's got a lot of good information in there. You're certainly welcome to take it, take it with you. I've got those in the back. 
and um, grab yourself a thumb drive if you want. There's a bunch of those back there. If, uh, they're just blank. Uh, you can have those and uh, a can koozie if you want to. So I've got a bunch of those back there. I wanted to bring something uh, for the presentation. Any other questions? It didn't take very long, but uh, anything that you might want to know about our company or the types of balancing valves, uh, I'm all open to anything you want to talk about. <coughs> Remember, we're local, so um, uh, you're, you're welcome. We do training. We do we do contractor training. We do engineering training. We do uh, all all different levels of training on all the topics I just talked about. So. It's always nice to have someone local to, to talk to. All right, well, thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Kevin made a comment about being local, and I know we've got a lot of not just web members here, but the other associations and trying to find ways to continue to link all these people to you. We're gonna share information after this. If you need contact information with any of these people that you don't have, let us know. We can help uh, connect you again further down the road. But uh, lunch will be here shortly, about five minutes or so. So by all means, uh, take a little break, use the restroom, go talk to Kevin and Colby and everyone over here who uh, is interested if, if you are. Otherwise, we'll have lunch. I'll we'll reconvene in about 45 minutes to an hour um, and keep going. I, I think it, no one would complain if we stayed ahead, ahead of schedule just a little bit. So hopefully we can continue on that path. So. Eat the traffic. I never thought I'd be excited to see traffic. No, yeah, like, oh, we're back to normal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, my gosh. Now we're getting out of hands. Well, I did that for a while. But it's a time management. I 